Hello and welcome to this series of lectures on uh, how to analyze normal gait uh, for the clinician. The this uh, lecture is divided into several parts. The first part is the introduction and this is me whom I am now introducing myself, uh, Dr. Michael Sussman. I work here in Portland, Oregon up on the left coast, the west coast of the U.S., and this is the Shriners Hospital uh, where I work. So this is a girl with uh, spastic diplegic cerebral palsy, and you can see that her gait is abnormal. But in order to decide what type of interventions you might provide to help her walk more normally, uh, you, have to un you have to be able to define the specific abnormalities that she has so you can address them. In order to do this, you have to have a good understanding of normal gait, what the components of normal gait are, and have a systematic way of looking at gait so that you can identify the abnormalities that she has. So you can see when she walks, her feet point inward, internal foot progression angle, her heels are not touching the ground, and this may be because her ankles are plantar flexed or because her knees are flexed or both. You can see that she has probably some increased lumbar lordosis. The other thing that you can see is just looking at her overall gait pattern that she hold her, holds her arms out for balance. And this may be because of her specific uh, structural abnormalities, but may be a basic part of her cerebral palsy. The other thing you can see is she has a nice reciprocal gait pattern and she appears to be reasonably strong. These are all important issues. When we go through uh, medical training or physiotherapy training, we're taught a systematic approach to uh, treatment of patients. We have to first identify what problems they have and we do this by talking to them, getting a good history from either the patient or if it's a child from their parents. Then we do a thorough physical examination and then perhaps some special studies like x-rays or blood studies. Then you can develop a list of probable diagnoses and suggest a list of interventions to treat those diagnoses. We've all been taught a systematic way of performing a general uh, physical examination, starting up at the head and ending uh, with the extremities. But the extremity exam is frequently uh, not emphasized in, a, in most people's training, and particularly uh, gait, how they walk, is not addressed. So in patients with cerebral palsy who are able to walk, the major problems are abnormalities in the way they walk, that is, abnormalities in their gait. Therefore, we need to have a systematic approach to assessing their gait in order to identify the problems which can be corrected. But in order to do this, you have to have a really good understanding of normal gait and be able to separate gait into its component parts. And this uh, illustration here, this animation, which shows uh, muscles which are working concentrically being colored green, and when they work eccentrically being colored red, and I'll go into definitions of what I mean by that later, um, and how every step is like every other step. So it is really a cycle a repetitive cycle of uh, motion as long as you're walking on a uh, flat level surface. This animation comes from this excellent book by the group at uh, Gillette Hospital in Minnesota and uh, I highly recommend it to you. It not only talks about normal gait but also abnormal gait uh, and various interventions which are used to uh, address abnormal gait. A couple of years ago when I was getting ready to uh, give this lecture and was uh, reviewing it, I also happened to be reading this book, The Anatomy Lesson, uh, which is a sort of historical fiction type book discussing this painting, The Anatomy Lesson of Dr. Nicholas Toop by Rembrandt. 
it's one of Rembrandt's most famous paintings and actually uh, his first major painting. And if you look at it, you, you find that it really is a nice painting, that uh, it, it shows vividly what's going on here with this dissection. But if you know a little bit more about it, it actually makes it a lot more interesting and makes your understanding of it a lot deeper. Uh, first of all, you can see how you're drawn into the center of the painting where all the action is by, by the light, that the light at the borders of the painting is darker and at the center is uh, very much brighter. And so it draws you into the, the central focus of the painting. The other thing is, is that the men here are arranged in this triangular type position. Uh, except for this one guy whose head is uh, out of the triangle. And there's a reason for this. These men in the painting actually commissioned Rembrandt to, to produce the painting. Uh, and this guy uh, either didn't decide or didn't have the money initially, so he was not included. And Rembrandt had to include him uh, uh, subsequently, so he couldn't be included uh, in the uh, triangle. The other thing you'll notice is the forearm on the right side here appears to be disproportionately short. And there's also a reason for this, that this, the way these bodies were uh, obtained for dissection was from uh, criminals who were executed. And this man uh, had prior uh, arrests for shoplifting, and one of the penalties for shoplifting was amputation of the hand. And so he actually had a stump here and not a hand, and Rembrandt had to extrapolate uh, to what he thought the forearm would look like. Finally, the men in this painting, unlike a lot of paintings of the era where the, the figures were just sort of uh, looking blankly into space, are very engaged in the action in this picture. Uh, this man, you can see, is intently looking at the uh, forearm, whereas this man seems to be looking directly at you. So having this knowledge uh, enhances your enjoyment of this uh, painting. So gait analysis, like analysis of that uh, painting, is a systematic way to look at a subject walking and to find deviations from the normal pattern. So there are several things that make it possible to study gait in a scientific way. First of all, normal gait is well-defined and more important, consistent by age seven. Consistent meaning once the subject reaches a steady state, that is, takes a couple of steps and is at their usual walking velocity, each step is like every other step. Even most individuals who have an abnormal gait show a consistent gait pattern. That is, their gait is abnormal, uh, but it's repetitively abnormal in the same way, with some exceptions, of course. Patients with athetosis or ataxia uh, will not have a consistent gait pattern, but most patients with spastic diplegia or hemiplegia will. Gait can be measured and quantified by computer-based gait analysis, which is very helpful for assessing changes over time and changes with various interventions. But not everybody has a gait analysis lab. So as a matter of fact, most people don't. So what I'm gonna try and give you here is how to analyze gait by careful, systematic visual observation. We all possess an internal gait analysis system with reasonably good 3D acquisition and interpretive capacity, but imprecise storage and retrieval so that you can, you can on the spot, uh, um, if you do it in a systematic way, analyze a patient's gait, but remembering what that gait was like a year hence is probably gonna be difficult for most people. So there are scoring systems such as the Edinburgh 
visual score system, which is the most uh, uh, frequently used system by which you can score the motion at each joint, document this, and then assess differences with time or intervention. So if you're going to use this in any kind of a longitudinal way or uh, to do any kind of clinical research, I encourage you to look at this uh, paper which describes the Edinburgh system. So that's the end of part one and I hope you will continue and stay with me through the rest of the series of lectures.